What's up, I'm Van, and today I wanna to go through some practice questions for the AccuPlacer college level math test. So we're gonna go through 20 examples and let's get started. So first up here, we have to simplify this expression. And the first thing I notice is that we could factor the first expression as we have two to the five halves. So two to the five over two, we could rewrite this as two to the three halves times two to the two over two. Now, the reason why I'm doing this is that this is gonna allow us to factor this expression and we could take out a two to the three halves, and that tells us that on the leading term here, we're gonna be left with two to the two over two. Because notice two to the three halves times two to the two halves is equal to two to the five halves. And then if we factor out two to the three halves on the second term, we're gonna be left with one like this. But just know two to the two over two, well, two divided by two is one, so now we could call this two to the three halves times two to the first minus one, and now this is just gonna be two to the three halves times one, which is equal to two to the three halves. So this is gonna match up with choice C. So for this one here, we have to do a little bit of algebra and they're telling us here that A does not equal B. So we're solving for X. So the first thing that jumps out at me is let's subtract one over A on both sides. And now this is gonna give us one over X and this is gonna cancel out equals one over B minus one over A. But just know the, any, the only time we're allowed to combine fractions into a single fraction by subtraction is when they have common denominators. So I would multiply this first fraction by A over A, and I would multiply the second fraction by B over B. So now they have denominators of a matching term here. We have AB and AB on this denominator. So in the next line here, what we're gonna have is we're gonna have one over X equals A minus B over A times B. Because notice I have A over AB minus B over AB, and that gets us here. Now, just know anytime you have one fraction equal to another fraction, let's say like this, algebraically, you are allowed to flip both sides and say two over one equals eight over four in this case. Like this is a true statement. You cannot flip all the fractions in the beginning because these were three separate fractions here. But once you get it down to this step where you have one fraction equals another, you can flip both sides and say that X over one or X so we get to say x over one, or just call it x, is equal to the reciprocal of the right side, which would be ab over a minus b, and that's gonna match choice e. So for question three, we have this equation here, and we wanna find the value of x minus one third squared. So looking at this, we could try to factor this and find the roots, we could try the quadratic formula, but one thing that's jumping out at me is if we take that equation, and let's say we divide everything by three. Well, then we would have x squared minus two divided by three x, plus seven over three is equal to zero. And this is looking like completing the square. So the technique for completing the square is that we have to analyze what I like to call, or what's commonly known as the B term. And in this case here, we have A is equal to one, that's the coefficient of X squared. B is equal to negative two thirds, and C is equal to seven thirds. But we have to take half of the B term. So we're taking half of this, and let's make that neater. So half of negative two thirds and then squaring it. Now just know anytime you take half of a fraction, you're just doubling the denominator. Um, so we would have negative two over six and then negative two over six reduces to negative one third. So we'd have negative one third squared, which would make positive one over nine. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna move the other term to the other side. So I'm gonna subtract seven thirds on both sides. But now this mystery number that we're gonna add to both sides is one ninth and once again, the technique for finding that mystery number is that we wanna take half of the B term and square it. Okay, so when we take half of this B term, it leaves us with negative one third, squared gives us one ninth. So that's what we add to both sides, and the reason why we do that is it turns this trinomial here into a perfect square. So now what I could say is we have X minus one third times X minus one third. And if you wanna double check, if you expand this, you would have x squared minus one third x minus one third x, which gives us this, and then negative one third times negative one third is plus one over nine. So this is how this is gonna check out. And then notice on the left side, this is gonna simplify to x minus one third squared equals, which is what we're trying to find. So now we look at these values here, and all we have to do is combine these fractions. This one needs a matching denominator with this one, so we could just do times three over three, and that gives us negative 21 over nine plus one over nine, so that tells us that the right side is gonna simplify to negative 20 over nine. And this is gonna work out to choice E. For question four, we wanna find an equation of a straight line that's parallel 
to the graph of y equals 2x. So just know anytime you have lines that are parallel, that means that they have the same slope. So what I'm really looking for in this question is the line that we're trying to find. Well, we're trying to find a line parallel to y equals 2x and y equals 2x, that line has a slope of two if we think of the equation y equals mx plus b. So then I'm just scanning through the answer choices and you could kind of do that algebra in your head that you're trying to see which one when you solve for y is gonna have a two in front of the x. And it's looking like choice C and I'll show you like the math that I did in my head if I pull that out to the side here, we have, 2x minus y is equal to 4, is that we could add y to both sides. And that's going to give us 2x equals y plus 4. And then we subtract 4 on both sides. And notice we have y equals 2x minus 4. So this line also has a slope of 2, which would make these two lines parallel. For question 5, there's a few ways we could go forward with this, but we want the equation of a line that contains the origin and the point 1, 2. So the origin is the point zero, zero. So what you could do here is just plug zero, zero and one, two into all the answer choices and see which one matches up here. So right away, it's looking like five is choice A. If I wanted to do this the more long-winded way, I could use the formula y minus y1 equals m times x minus x1. And what we could do is find the slope between those two points. And remember the slope equation is y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1. So if we find the slope first, let's say we call this x1, y1, and we call this point x2, y2. Then we would have two minus zero over one minus zero, which is equal to two. So there's our slope. And then let's say I pick the point zero, zero. It doesn't matter which one we pick to plug into the equation of the line here. But what we would have next is y minus y1 equals the slope times x minus x1. And this is gonna give us y equals two x, which still matches choice A. Question six, there's a lot going on here. We have an apartment building with 12 units and there's one and two bedroom apartments. The one bedrooms rent for 360 a month and the two bedrooms rent for 450 a month. So now we have when all the units are rented, the total monthly rental is 4,950. What is the number of two bedroom apartments? So for this one here, this is a system of equations. So we could say X is let's say the one bedroom plus y is the two bedroom apartments, there's 12 of those. And what we're told is that the smaller apartments are 360 a month, plus the two bedroom apartments are 450 a month, and we could set that equal to 4,000, we could set it equal to 4,950. So then what we need to do here is just solve this system here by elimination. And we're gonna choose to eliminate the x since we're trying to solve for the number of two bedroom apartments, which is represented by y. So let's go ahead and do that. We're going to cancel X. So that means let's multiply everything on the bottom by negative 360. So we'll write that result over here. We have 360 X on top plus 450 Y equals 4,950. And on bottom, we have negative 360 X minus 360 Y equals, and now we're just doing 360 times 12. So I'm just going to pretend here, let's say we don't have a calculator. And what I'll do is I'll just do 36 times 12 and then throw a zero at the end. So we have two times six is 12, carry the one. Two times three is six, plus one is seven. And then one times six, one times three goes here. So this is gonna give us 4,320 when we do it this way, but there's gonna be a minus here. So now we're gonna add these equations together. This one's gonna cancel completely. This is gonna leave us with 90y equals, and now when we subtract, 5 minus 2 is 3, 9 minus 3 is 6. This is what we're left with. So now you have 90y equals 630. So I just divide both sides by 90. And you have the zeros go. Y equals 63 divided by 9 is 7. So there are seven apartments. There are seven two-bedroom apartments in this building. So question seven, we have these two squares. And this is the area inside in square yards. And we want to know how many yards of fencing are needed to enclose the two regions. So we're looking for the combined perimeter of these two squares. So what I notice here is that right away it jumps out at me that the side length of the first square is gonna be square root five. And the way you could go about this, if it's not jumping out at you, is just put an X there. X times X is X squared. So X squared equals five. Take the square root of both sides and that tells you the side length is square root five. Now I could do the same thing here and say the square root of the area, 125, tells us the side length of the bigger square. And you could even check if you multiply these two radicals together, it brings you back here. 
So then the combined perimeter of both of these squares, we're going to have, well, the perimeter of the first square is four times one of the side lengths. So it'd be four times square root of five. Plus the perimeter of the second square would be four times the side length of the bigger square is square root 125. But notice our answer is expressed as a single term. So that means we have to simplify this thing here. And what's jumping out at me, and I'll write it over here in this corner, is the square root of 125 breaks down as the square root of 25 times the square root of five. So this simplifies here to five square root five because the square root of 25 is five. So we could rewrite this now as four square root five plus four times five square root five. And now just multiply those coefficients. This is gonna give us four square root five plus 20 square root five. And now when we're adding radicals, just combine the coefficients. This is gonna make 24 square root five. So definitely choice C. Question eight can be easy if you know how to translate logs into exponentials, but just know that small number at the subscript location here is the base of the log. So this is the base, this is the exponent, and this is the result. So then what you do to turn this into exponent form is you write the base is 10, the exponent is three, and the result is X. So then we just have to simplify this, just do 10 times 10 times 10, which is equal to 1,000. So the value of X is 1,000. Question nine, we're finding F of G of X. So for composition of functions, notice we have the F of X function here, and I don't have any of the input values written. So when I want to find f of g of x, that means that we're going to replace each x with the function g of x. So in the next line, what we'll have is we're going to have 2 times g of x is equal to x minus 1 over 2, and then we just tack on the plus 1 at the end. Now 2 over 2 is going to cancel, and this is going to be equal to x minus 1 plus 1. Minus 1 plus 1 cancels, leaving us with just x. So we're going with choice A here. Question 10, it really helps to know this phrase, Sokotoa. Because when we're labeling a right triangle with the sine function here, we're going to label the opposite side in the hypotenuse. So we draw out a right triangle here, and angle theta is over here, and opposite of theta is 1, and the hypotenuse is 2. So once again, just know that sine theta is equal to the side opposite of theta over the hypotenuse of the right triangle. So that's why we're setting it up like this. So if we want to find the missing side, let's say we call this side x, we would have x squared plus 1 squared is equal to 2 squared. We're just using the Pythagorean theorem, which tells us that x squared plus 1 is equal to 4, so x squared is equal to 3, and x is equal to square root 3. So that's the missing side here, square root 3. So when we're looking to find cosine of angle theta, cosine is the ratio of the side adjacent to theta over the hypotenuse. And we just found the adjacent side is square root 3, and the hypotenuse is still 2. So we're going with choice D. For question 11, we have to factor. And notice that these expressions here match. We have a 2y minus 3 and a 2y minus 3. Now, what usually throws students off with questions like this, just know it's not written there, but there's an invisible times 1 attached at the end. So that way, when we factor, we're going to take out a 2y minus 3. That's what they have in common. But on the first term here, there's a 5y left. So we have 5y. And we have plus, there's a 1 left on the second term. So we have 5y plus 1. So now we just scan the answer choices. We have 5y plus 1 times 2y minus 3. This is going to be choice B. Question 12, we want to know for what real numbers x is this quadratic negative. So what I'm imagining in my head is that when you have a quadratic, when you're trying to find out when the quadratic is negative, I'm just drawing something random here, it's going to be between the roots. So notice we have a positive x squared. So this is a smiling parabola. So the key is that we have to find the two roots, and then it's going to be all the x values between those two roots. So now we start to factor this. We have x minus 3 times x minus 3 would give us, uh, the you know, factoring this quadratic, we set it equal to 0. Uh, but the, the catch here is that there's a single root at x equals 3, which means that this quadratic is tangent to the graph. So if I draw that over here, what this is going to look like is this is going to look something like this. Okay, so that's what the graph looks like. So for what real numbers x is this graph negative? For no real numbers x, so we're going with choice E. Question 13, we have to find a root of this quadratic equation. And notice all the answers are irrational because we have the square root of non-perfect squares, which kind of hints here that we should use the quadratic formula. And just know the quadratic formula, we have x equals negative b plus or minus the square root of b squared minus 4ac all over 2a. So what we're going to do is just find lowercase a, b, and c. And those are just the coefficients. So the coefficient of x squared is 1. The coefficient of x is negative 5. And the constant at the end is negative 1. So now we just plug in. We have x equals 
negative negative five is positive five, plus or minus the square root of, and then we have negative five squared minus four times one times negative one, all divided by two times a, and a is equal to one. So now just simplify this as five plus or minus the square root of, and this is gonna work out to inside the radical as 25, and we have negative four times negative one is positive four, which is gonna leave us with a 29 under the square root over two times one is two. So we're looking for five plus or minus the square root of 29 over two, and that's gonna match up with choice E. So we have five plus square root 29 over two. So question 14, we could just draw this out. We have a graph of y equals x squared, which looks like this. And so this is just a rough sketch. And then we have a circle with the center at zero one, which is gonna be above this. And the circle is gonna have radius three. So that means it's gonna go below the vertex. It's gonna go down one, two, three. And it's gonna go out three units in every direction here like this. So this is important to know. Now, how do I know that it's gonna go further out than the parabola? Well, notice we're at a height of y equals one when we're at the center. And when is the parabola reaching a height of one at x equals one and at x equals negative one, we would be at this height. So if I go out three, I'm definitely gonna go past the parabola in this direction. So now when we connect the circle like this, you could see that the circle is gonna hit the parabola twice. So we're going with choice C. Question 15, we have the graph of a linear function and we're told y equals mx plus b. We wanna find m, which represents the slope. Well, just know the formula for slope, you have y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1. So if we just label these points, this is x1, y1, and this is x2, y2. Then we could just plug these into the formula and m equals, we would have r minus zero over x2 minus x1 would give us zero minus s. And this is gonna give us r over negative s, which is the same thing as negative r over s. So this gives us choice A. So question 16, we have one ordering of these letters from left to right is U, T, V, W. We wanna know the total number of orderings of these letters from left to right. And one thing that's important to note here is that all these letters are different. So you have to think here, how many options do we have for each letter? Well, the first letter that we place down, we have four options. But since there's no repeats, we're gonna use each letter exactly once. We have three letters left to choose from because we already placed one down. Then we have two, then we have one, and now we just have to multiply these four terms together here. We have four times three is 12, times two is 24. So this is gonna be choice E. Question 17, we have f of x, and this notation stands for inverse, and this is the inverse function of f. We have to find f inverse of three. So there's a few ways we could go about this here. We could find the inverse function directly by, normally this says y equals, and then we have our function of x. So if we switch x and y, we could say x equals three y minus one over two, and then we solve for y, and that's gonna be our inverse function. So we would have two times x equals three y minus one. And now just a little bit of algebra here, we're gonna add one to both sides. And this is gonna give us, we'll have two x plus one equals three y, and now divide both sides by three. And this tells us our inverse function. So we could write our inverse function out explicitly to be equal to two x plus one over three. So now what we could do here, if we wanna find what is the value of f inverse of three, we just plug in three to this function. And we'd have two times three plus one over three. And that's gonna to simplify to seven over three, which matches choice E. Question 18, we have a sequence and it's defined by, we have the first term a sub zero is equal to one. And we have a sub n plus one is equal to two times a sub n plus two. So this is a recursive sequence and we wanna find what is the value of a sub three. So the way recursive sequences work is that they're built by the stuff before them. So what we have here, let's say I wanna find a sub one. Well, a sub one would be corresponding to n is equal to zero. Because notice if I plug in n equals zero here, I get zero plus one giving us a sub one, and that would give us n is equal to zero here. We'd have two times n equals zero, so we have a sub zero plus two. And now we're told what the first term is, a sub zero is equal to one, so this would make two times one plus two, which is equal to four. So now that's a one, so if I wanna find what is a two, now I'm gonna have two times a sub one plus two. And notice here, this is the case where n is equal to one now, because a sub one plus one would give us a sub two. And now we just plug in, we have two times, we found a sub one to be equal to four, and now plus two, and then eight plus two is equal to 10. So now we just gotta do this once more. So a sub three is equal to two times a sub two plus two, 
and now we just have two times the term before it is 10 plus two, and that's gonna give us 22, which matches choice E. Question 19, we have five employees at a company. A group of three employees will be chosen to work on a project. We wanna know how many different groups of three can be chosen. So for a question like this, you have to know the difference between a combination and a permutation. In a permutation, which I'll just abbreviate, order matters. And that would mean that the order in which you select the people makes a difference. But in this case, we're gonna use a combination because order does not matter. And I'll talk about that in a moment after we finish this. So order does not matter. Now, why doesn't order matter in this question? Well, let's say these three people are working on the project. It doesn't matter which order they're selected in because those three are still gonna be the same group no matter which order they were picked. So in this case, we're doing five combination three. And now to evaluate this without a calculator, we do a permutation starting at five going out three. So we have five times four times three, but since order doesn't matter, we're gonna divide by three factorial. So we're gonna divide by three times two times one. And now we just simplify this here. We could get rid of these common threes and this is gonna make 20 divided by two, which is 10. So this is gonna be choice D. Question 20, we have f of x equals one third x. A is less than B, which of the following must be true? So we're looking for which must be true. And for this question, I would just draw this out. If I look at the graph of one third to the x power, this is an exponential function, but it's decreasing because the base here is a fraction between zero and one. So as x increases, we're multiplying one third by itself more and more, which shrinks the graph like this. So if A is over here, and B is over here, we're just throwing them in random places because A is less than B. What this tells us is that this point is A F of A, and this point here is B F of B. But since A is less than B, notice as the graph goes on, the Y values get smaller, which means that F of A has to be greater than F of B. So this is gonna match up with choice E. And once again, it's choice E because our function is decreasing. So as we pick values to the right, the function values are gonna be smaller. 